<laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The end of the world is coming. Yes, the world we are living on, the planet called Earth, is going to be destroyed by our sun. The same sun that nurtures sprouting plant life, that warms cheeks on beaches, that fuels our planet's climate and atmosphere through passive radiation, is going to burn us to a cinder. It has been predicted by scientific methods, peer-reviewed and rigorously verified by leading members of the scientific community. The end of the world is coming, for sure. And while it's not going to happen for a few billion years, and you and I and everyone we know and everyone who is yet to be born will have met a more intimate, tangible end long before that happens, knowing that the world is not a permanent fixture of the universe can give us some perspective into our own mortality. If we consider how wonderful a planet it is, how lucky we are to have lived here or to have lived at all, what a strange set of circumstances led to this moment of here and now, getting to play our parts in the history of the universe as living, breathing, thinking beings of mind and body, the greatest witnesses to the existence of the universe that, as far as we can tell so far, have ever existed <clears throat> on any rock, around any star, anywhere across time or space. The moment in which you can do is always now. What better use of your now than using that amazing brain of yours to tune into another episode of This Week in Science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. Kirsten and Blair. <laughs> What's going on? Kiki, you're muted. Well, I'm muted. Yay! <laughs> Somebody's getting excited about science. That's what's happening here. We've got screaming in the background. We've got, you know, muting that takes place occasionally. <gasps> But it's another week of science, and welcome everyone to the show. Um, we've got a great, great lineup of stories ahead, and uh, what did I bring? I brought stories about synthetics, magnetics, and yeah, what makes a movie line so memorable. What'd you bring, Justin? Justin? I've got modest alcoholics living longer, moving things with your brain, uh, chilling out during a heart attack could save your brain, a video on recycling if we have time, and uh, there was another story that is, uh, ooh, yeah, uh, what happens to your brain as you age? Got a lot of brainy stuff. I love brainy stuff. You're pandering to me, aren't you? A little bit. <laughs> or, or I'm pandering to my own brain too. I've got my own brain. It's also like talk about me more. <laughs> talk <laughs> when about it does my everything. Brain. Yeah. You never mention me. That ego brain. Blair, what did you bring for the animal corner? I brought a story about rock hyraxes. And those of you who don't know what a hyrax is, go ahead and Google that right now. <laughs> and about their language skills. Those squeals and chuffs might actually mean something. Pretty interesting. I think it sounds fascinating, and I can't wait to hear about it. So let's jump in, shall we? Shall we dive into the news today? How about some th synthetics, right? Normally, we think about synthetics in terms of fabric, you know, fabric that... And, and there, I remember polyester used to be a bad word at one point in time when I was growing up. It was the, the question of whether or not your sweater was polyester or cotton or wool. But now synthetics are starting to mean something entirely different because researchers are trying to create the building blocks of life synthetically. And researchers... Um, have published a new study. This study just uh, came out. Came out today. Uh, they're they're from the Biodesign Institute, 
of, at Arizona State University. These researchers have created synthetic DNA and RNA. And what they're calling it is XNA. So instead of DNA or RNA, um, they're calling it XNA. And the X stands for xeno or strange. So strange nucleic acids. Um, and what they've done is they've taken the normal backbone for a nucleic acid and then swapped the sugar groups that are that are kind of attached to the sides of the molecule. And so instead of the normal DNA molecules, A, T, C, G, um, you're going to have something that's completely new and potentially very different. And this is something that's been going, people have been doing this, researchers have been doing this, this synthetic uh, molecule making, this analogous molecule making for some time. However, this is the first time that researchers have not only created the XNA, but they've also created uh, polymerase, which is an enzyme that can open up DNA and helps with uh, transcribing of DNA into proteins. So the, the process of uh, transcription, you open up the DNA, so like the DNA, it's wrapped in the double helix form, you open it up, the zipper opens up so that the copying machinery can get a hold of it and um, and copy it into an RNA form. That RNA then will go on to be transcribed into or translated into a protein. And so they've taken that machinery, created their own uh, a polymerase that acts on this DNA that will take the synthetic DNA, open it up, and take the synthetic form, transcribe it into natural DNA. So it's very much, it, it, it interacts with normal DNA and then translates it back, transcribes it back to synthetic DNA form. So... In this process, they allowed for uh, the passing of information from one uh, molecule to the next. And so they created a, a system where these molecules, these nucleotide molecules, um, could would have to attach uh, to a, a matrix. And if they attached very tightly, then they wouldn't get washed off, which meant, okay, they'd survive to the next quote-unquote generation. Um the uh, the survivors then became better and better at holding on, and those became more efficient at this at at having this particular design. Um, so, what they've created is a system where synthetic DNA passes on information and to the next generation and evolves because the more uh, fit molecules survive through the washing to pass their information on. So there's evolution and there is heredity in this synthetic system. And that is really exciting because it means that this is a proof of concept that we could really one day be creating synthetic organisms with a completely foreign uh, backbone of genetic material that isn't even based on DNA, but is based on uh, synthetic molecules, XNA molecules that were created by man, but allow for completely new processes and interactions to take place. Additionally, this means that the um, there's a possibility of other alien life forms having a similar DNA-like structure, helical in nature, that allows, uh, that is their uh, genetic information uh, backbone, but that it's made up of completely different components. If we can make synthetic stuff here on our planet, how come, how do we know that different environmental, uh, different environmental parameters might not have pushed uh, a different environment to create life in a slightly different way? So it's a radical, radical study and um, just, just fascinating. And I, I just, the, the idea of synthetic biology and synthetic genomics and what we could potentially do with it in the future is... is well, the is, first thing that pops into my head is the terraforming of Mars. I mean, we, yeah. we could construct uh, the microbes that could work the soils, you know, the, the, the life form that could survive the Martian climate. Uh, 
engineering it for that planet, right? And then transport it there and begin the first steps of a terraforming that would make the, uh, you know, the, the first inroads for humans to one day be able to, that's, that I think is the most amazing potential. We can, we could customize mm -hmm. a life form for an existing planet. Right. Well, the, I mean, we could, we could potentially, it's not just that we could take um, existing DNA. So there's the synthetic biology side of, all right, let's take the DNA we already know exists in bacteria and just mix and match it or take, uh, you know, this gene out of this bacterium and put it into this other bacterium so that it's better at uh, chewing up soil or creating oxygen or, you know, whatever you want it, want it to do. So we could do that. But this is like adding to the genetic code so that you can add completely new um, possibilities to the functions of genes that have never been seen before. So it's, this is 100% experimental and not something that is a, something that has so far been vetted by the natural world, which is really interesting. Hmm. Could be cool. Made by man, not by nature. Yeah, let's put our unnatural synthetic bacteria on Mars. <laughs> yeah, we should probably, if we're going to practice with this stuff, uh, the Mars is going to be a little bit safer. Anyway, right? Yeah, we, exactly. we might not know how it's going to interact, but uh, do it on Mars first. Uh, likely, we're not uh, interfering with any future life. And who cares if we are killing a couple of <laughs> those stray microbes that we could never detect that were hiding yeah. deep, deep yeah. under the soil? Let's it put it something there that works. <laughs> yeah, right? Works for us, right? Yeah. yeah. It works for itself eventually. And then, you know, uh, discovers Earth a billion years from now. And is like, oh, hey, look. Wonder if there's ever been life on this rock. Yeah, you <laughs> would totally be like a green, a green or a green Martian. Did you write, read the Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars series? Um, yeah. Robinson? Yeah. I thought they were really boring, though. I didn't. There, get well, there was like the they, were, they turned into the different political environmental groups, and so on yeah. Mars, once they had started colonizing, there were the um, the traditionalists who wanted to keep Mars the way that it is that we that humans shouldn't terraform, leave it as it is, don't change anything, and then there are, were the one the individuals who wanted to terraform and green Mars, make it green, make it a place that that people could live, and so there was this battle between these different political movements, and that I thought was rather interesting, the environmentalist side of mucking with other other planets. Which you understand it here on Earth because that's our planet. But then it's like, wait, but that's a different planet that we haven't even really touched Ooh. with human hands yet. So except, except if we touch it with human hands and we come up with a version of the synthetic uh, life form that could survive on Mars. Mm -hmm. And so does China. And Russia has its own version. And India has its own version. And they're all up there. But they're slightly incompatible and our green aliens keep getting the red alien flu. Oh, yeah, that could be a whole different, <laughs> be a whole different ball game right there. That it could. <gasps> All right. What stories do you have? What did you bring? What's your first? Um, hang on, I've got to fix my I, computer here. I, All right. Ready? It's three o'clock. <laughs> no, no, the stories are ready to rock and roll. My computer, on the other hand, is dying quickly. Uh, this is a pretty amazing story. Northwestern medicine scientists have done sup something so shockingly spineless that even a paralyzed finger or two was lifted at them. They created a brain machine that Whoa. sends signals directly from the brain to muscles, bypassing entirely the spinal cord. Uh, this is uh, then therefore enabling voluntary complex movement of a paralyzed hand without the need of going through the spinal cord. The device could eventually be tested on and perhaps aid paralyzed patients. So they have, this is a um, sort of uh, in the area of, we've, of stories that we've covered before. Yeah. Understanding that the motor cortex fires off signals in certain ways 
They have in the past been able to get uh, uh, monkeys to operate a video game and even a robotic arm remotely just using the, their brain uh, and not using any, you know, anything else. So yeah. what the next step was, was to try to get this down to the point where you could actually manipulate muscles so that it's moving not another computer interface, but now moving actual physical limbs and appendages on, on a body. This is uh, Lee E. Miller, professor of neuroscience, Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, who is the lead investigator of the study published in Nature. He says, we are eavesdropping on the natural electrical signals from the brain that tell the arm and hand how to move and sending these signals directly to the muscles. This connection from brain to muscles might someday be used to help patients paralyzed due to spinal cord injury perform activities of daily living and achieve greater independence. So thus far, the, the most advanced sort of artificial limbs uh, or uh, what, do, uh, the, um, what do you call them? There's a word for uh, prostheses. Yep, neuroprostheses. Have been... Pretty, pretty simple. I mean, you, I mean, pretty simple, but pretty amazing too, if you're paralyzed, you, but you have to have some sort of motor function still. So you, if you shrugged your shoulder up, it would advance the arm. If you pulled it, shrugged it down, it would open or close the hand. You were using muscles from one part of your body to signal, uh, the, the mechanical uh, prostheses to do something. This is completely different. This is using They've got it down to I think it's a hundred neurons of hundred neurons in the brain that are actually the control <laughs> control system for this. The uh, research that they did was done in monkeys whose electrical brain and muscle signals were recorded by implanted electrodes. So they're sort of recording as they grasp a ball, as they lift something, as they do a physical energy. The motor cortex fires off in a certain pattern. They record this. They say, okay, this is associated with the grabbing of a ball. This is lifting your arm. This is this. This is that. And they developed an algorithm to decode the different functions, different motions. And then they, uh, they basically, uh, <laughs> the researchers gave the, the monkeys a local anesthetic. So they didn't, they didn't sever the spinal cord of the monkeys to do this experiment. Uh, they did a, 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 a nerve blocking anesthetic at the elbow, causing temporary painless paralysis of the hand. They then used the help of special devices in the brain and the arm together with a neuroprosthesis. The monkey brain signals were used to control tiny electric currents delivered in less than 40 milliseconds to their muscles. So it's instantaneous. This isn't a send the signal and wait for it to happen. This is real time. Causing them to contract, allowing the monkeys to pick up the ball and complete the task nearly as well as they did before. That's That right there, too, is out... Uh, just, Amazing, you know. Not only that, did they get it to work? Kinda, they got it to work. Uh, this is a uh, again Miller. The monkey won't use his hand perfectly, but there is a process of motor learning that we think is very similar to the process you go through when you learn a new computer mouse or different tennis racket, or when you just first get on the planet. Things are different, and you learn to adjust to them. So uh, they're chalking up the little bit of imperfections in the test to a record, you know, the brain needing to sort of figure out what's going on and, and gain better control over the activity in the future. This is just, it's so wild. The, because the researchers computed the relationship between brain activity and muscle activity, the neuroprosthesis actually senses and interprets a variety of movements a monkey may want to make, theoretically mm -hmm. enabling it to make a range of voluntary hand movements. And they did this, they did, in the new this system, uh, a tiny implant called a multi-electrode array detects the activity of about, here it is, 100 neurons in the brain yeah. and serves as the interface between the brain and the computer that deciphers the signals to generate hand movements. So totally awesome. Yeah, this is the, that's the thing that's um, that's the the sticking point is the actual implant. At this point in time, you know, getting an implant in a human head, you can do that, but then how long is it going to last? And um, will will it 
uh, deteriorate or the, over time? How long will it be before, you know, the organic system eats away at the inorganic materials that are used in the electrode um, and you have to replace it? How long, you know, how long will it work? Which and is a real can, hassle. It's very if, invasive. It's a very invasive, uh, tremendous hassle if you're trying to, say, uh, put an MP3 player in your head so you don't have to carry one. <laughs> if, you're, if you're paralyzed, uh, and this is going to give you a range of, of motion. Right. It's, it's a little bit, it's a little <laughs> different. It's still, yeah, it's still not, <laughs> it's not perfect. But that's, I mean, that's why they're still not actually doing this on people yet. But the, the technology and, is moving along at a fast clip. And again, not perfect when you're paralyzed is uh, is a matter of degrees. I mean, yep. that's that's yep. right. Like, yeah, it's that's going to be the least of the thing. The thing is going to be, OK, can I run now? Because that's, you know, people aren't going to want to. OK, I can move. Now I've got some move, movement of my hands and arms. Now I want to go jogging. <laughs> I want to get out of my right. house and go drive. Uh, Which is the, the interesting thing is that uh, if something like running or walking doesn't take as complex Motor, uh, motor skill, the muscle activity to do running or walking is actually very simple compared to all the muscles involved in moving your hand. So doing something like just closing your hand and opening each finger individually, there are a, a wide range of large and small muscles that are involved in that and actually making fine or complicated uh, hand and wrist movements, that is a feat. And if you can get there, mm -hmm. you can absolutely just trigger muscles in your, in your legs to, to lead towards running. I mean, that's something that's, that's, that's not the, uh, the difficult thing. Right. And, and it, and it may be, it may be that the, the next step is, uh, because uh, I'll, I'll read this a little bit here at the end. Uh, Miller also says we can extract a remarkable amount of information from only a hundred neurons even though there are literally millions of neurons involved in making that mov movement. One reason is that these are the output neurons that normally send signals to the muscles. Behind these neurons are many others that are making the calculations the brain needs in order to control movement. We're looking at the end result from all those calculations. So what it is is those are still functioning. That, th all those millions of neurons involved in, in coordinating a movement are actually already involved. They send it to this... Yeah. 100 neurons, then these 100 neurons are the ones that actually send out the, they're like the go buttons. They're part so, of it. Yeah. There are more than just those 100, but they're getting a good picture from those right. 100 of, right. of so, what activity is happening in the motor cortex. Right. But, uh, but, the, but if, if most of the calculations aren't output, but are calculating, taking in feedback, coming out, sending more information to the output, but aren't directly uh, triggering, then they've done something really yeah. brilliant, which is you... You've got millions of neurons that are funneling down to these hundred, and yeah. those hundred are sending out those decisions. Uh, that that could be that could be a a, a, a lot fat. A lot, it's, I think it could happen a lot quicker than I would have ever guessed possible. Um, so really, that's this is one of the this is probably the best. I mean, this is the latest. Who knows what the best will be? This is the, the latest. And uh, a story we've sort of been covering for a long time that this also yes. all happened by accident. This is the this is the great uh, story where they had the they were doing they were just sort of recording the motor cortex uh, on of monkey brains, and they had these three I think there were walnuts set out there, and as the monkey would reach for one and grab it, the motor cortex would fire, and the the register on the computer would make some kind of sound or another and record the event. And what they noticed was, uh, by accident, they were clearing the experiment. They were going to start over, you know, and the monkey's sitting there still watching. And one of the lab assistants came over and took away the, reached over and grabbed the walnuts and pulled them away. And when the monkey saw that, the brain fired exactly the same way as, uh, as it did when they physically did it themselves, showing that even when you see something, you're still firing off those. So you can think it, the motor cortex isn't a result of, of you grabbing something. It's yeah. what triggers it and it's the intention of doing it is there as well. Yeah, yeah. Those are in the mirror neurons. Very brilliant stuff. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's, it's great work and it, the, what it's going to do for people is 
going to be amazing. And I can't wait. I can't wait to see it come out. (gasps) You're listening to This Week in Science, and it's time for Blair's Animal Corner. Blair's Animal Corner with Blair. (laughs) So today, I have a story about rock hyraxes. Um, Those of you who don't know what a hyrax is, it looks like it would be in the rodent family but it's not, it's actually in the family with manatees and elephants. But this thing looks like, I guess, a mix between a rabbit and a rat. But they're from uh, the Middle East and parts of Asia and parts of Africa. And they live in rocks. And they live in, this type of hyrax lives in rocks. And they have very interesting songs. And um, if you play it on your computer, will we be able to hear it if you hit the link? No, there's, I okay. can't play it myself. So on but. the on the article that'll be in the show notes, there's a link to a Hyrax song that you can listen to. And they started studying these songs and they started studying them in different regions in Israel. And this came out of the University of Haifa in Israel. And they found that there's actually syntax to their songs. Basically, a song can last for several minutes, but they can be broken down into sections that last 10 to 20 seconds. And each one of those sections called bouts has a number of notes, which then they call syllables. And there are only a small number of these syllables, and each one is very, very different. And out of those, you can combine them in different ways to try to indicate different things if you're a hyrax. What they found was that the order was actually deliberate. Hmm. And beyond that, the order varied from one region to another which not only indicated syntax, but also dialects. That's cool. I think that uh, that Brian, our engineer, maybe can hit the play button to, to play the audio. I don't know if there was... Sounds... I think there's a bird in there, too. It's like a squeaky toy. Like a, it's like a squeak. <laughs> and so they called the different uh, types Thanks. of sounds uh, whales, chucks, snorts, squeaks, and tweets. <laughs> nice. And they did mathematical analysis in order to figure out that they were not random organizations and they weren't mm-hmm. just copying each other. They were actually completely deliberate, which kind of totally blows away what we would think about what a most mammals and especially smaller mammals with smaller brains would be capable of doing. (laughs) I mean, we know that whales do these kinds of things and, and bats and obviously birds. Um, But what I thought was interesting was you look at this animal and you don't think it's probably capable of deliberate language. But then when you think about the fact that they're related to elephants, elephants communicate with Mm -hmm. very low sounds that we can't hear. Mm -hmm. So if they're related that, kind of makes sense to me. Um, but this this kind of blows out of the water what we thought most mammals could do to communicate. And so we kind of yeah. then have it to take, think... It's the next step from just communication right. to actually language. So a lot of animals will have call and response right. or they have a song that indicates they're, you know, they want to mate but the but beyond that what it, what what other communication is going on and so right. this means that there might be something much more complex in the signals that they're sending yeah and there's lots of species especially species that are uh, social groups uh, like prairie dogs that have warning calls that just mm-hmm. mean dangers coming yeah but that's a very simple communication i think there's a lot of animals that do that yeah <laughs> and this hyrax is not in danger when he's talking he's actually trying to advertise his behavior or his his area and his own uh physical fitness to females mm-hmm. and so the complexness of the song also indicates physical fitness right and all that kind of stuff which is very similar to bird song yeah that's very similar sure. to bird song. And, and I'm, I'm mostly amazed that this thing that looks kind of like a chubby squirrel mm-hmm. <clears throat> is more related to an elephant than a uh, rodent. Yeah. I know. That's inter- genetics. The genetic analysis of, of uh, relatedness, I think, is just yeah. opening up some really interesting yeah. relationships. I guess yeah. just in the you know radiation of all the small mammals in that area this elephant relative did better than the 
rodenty things because mm-hmm. I don't think there's as, there's as many rabbits and things like that out there as there I have are no idea. of these. No, other but there things. is the little what is it called? The little Pikachu. The Pikachu. Yeah, oh, it's like a, a pika a, or a pika. A pika. Yeah. Yeah, with a really super cute little rodent with the giant ears. <sighs> like oh, it's so cute. It's like the cutest rodent that's uh, ever lived. He's running around out there. In Justin's opinion, <laughs> if you if you if you see a uh, if you see a picture of it, they are know. pretty cute. It's so cute. <laughs> it does kind of look like Pikachu. Pika. 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 That's where Pikachu Pika. came from. He's one of those. So this is, uh, I guess, the uh, the the question now is, what do all the what does it mean? Like, if they can mix up the syllables and actually. Uh, create unique messages based on the sounds and the syllables like what and and the fact that there are dialects what do they have different messages that they're right. sending that are in there yeah so from their research it, it kind of looked like the the man in charge dr kirschenbaum said that he thinks the so hyrax song is more similar to bird song and that they are not encoding much information hmm. but i think that's that makes sense and that makes the most sense but it's possible since there is dialect difference it mm-hmm. just seems like it would make more sense and that the order is important just makes it sound like there's there's something specific that they're indicating with that even if it's not directly language it hi i am me yeah <laughs> i am not the other guy i am me Language is such a weird <laughs> thing to define because yeah. we have sentence structure and yeah. direct indications from what we say, but maybe in the Hyrax song, they are saying something that we just ha- are having trouble interpreting. Which would not be surprising. No. And then no. because the Hyrax has this complex communication that we didn't know about, then you have to start wondering what other animals we've overlooked and thought that they just, they didn't really have that. Yeah. And you mentioned, now you wonder. yeah, and you mentioned the uh, the communication of elephants and how they use subsonics mm-hmm. to be able to communicate over long distances. Um, you know, these are there are also many sounds in different frequency bands right. that we might even not even be listening to, yeah. that we're not recording and hearing. So we find that mice are actually singing, um, and it, the little squeaks that we hear are just part of the songs that mice sing. Yeah, I always wonder if all those animals that we call deaf that don't make sound, if they're actually making sound and we can't hear it. They hum. Like the giraffe. I always wonder about gir- yeah. that giraffe, if he's actually saying something that sitting gi- there. That giraffe. <laughs> that giraffe's got a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, we are just about at our halfway point. I just want to, speaking of song. Um, I'm going to throw out here, this isn't a song story, but it is about birds. Um, There's been an idea for a long time that birds potentially have magnetic neurons. And I never thought that they had magnetic neurons, but that they had magnetic cells in their beaks near their eyes that would, uh, and when I say magnetic, that they, these cells contain magnetic particles, ferric particles. Um, but that there were these cells in birds' beaks that allowed them to orient uh, with the magnetic fields of the earth to be able to migrate. However, a pretty comprehensive study has uh, debunked this completely. They they uh, sliced up a bunch of pigeon beaks and they found with through staining and uh, and different microscopy techniques, they found that indeed those cells that contained magnetic information, yes, magnetic particles, they were there, but they're not they're not neurons. They're not cells that belong. Uh, they're, they are uh, macrophages. So they are a completely, different group of cells and they don't actually, uh, they found them throughout the pigeon's bodies. That's, I think, the the big thing. It's not just in the beak, but they found these cells throughout the pigeon's bodies. So. Does that yeah. mean that we can use them as magnets? Pigeons? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't just stick to your fridge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just 
Stick a pigeon to your fridge. It'll hold your son's <laughs> homework there. <sighs> yeah. So now back to the drawing board. We have to actually say, okay, well, they maybe they don't have magic magnetic powers, <coughs> excuse me, or see it, the magnetic field of the earth with these magnetic, magnetic particles. Uh, maybe there's something else that's going on. So... This is out. The study is called Clusters of Iron-Rich Cells in the Upper Beak of Pigeons are Macrophages, Not Magnetosensitive Neurons. Bing! Case closed. And that brings us to the break. It is our halfway point, and uh, this is This Week in Science. We will be back after this with more science. Yes. Oh, patience is the only thing I need, but Twist would like to thank Audible.com for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Science. Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 75,000 different titles in a variety of different genres. Twist has found many science-based books in the Audible library, and we hope that you will too. You can start a free trial today. Get a free audiobook download from their collection. So many to choose from, so little time. Do it now. All you have to do is sign up at audiblepodcast.com slash twist. That's right. The website is audiblepodcast.com slash twist. And you get a free download. Twist also has merchandise that you might enjoy. So head on over to twist.org and purchase our 2010 science music compilation CD. That's right. 2010 music compilation CD is still on sale and a world robot domination t-shirt. That's right. Those are the things that we have to offer right now. Get yours while the offer lasts. Uh, Twists, additionally, uh, to being supported by things that you buy from us, we are supported by donations from you. They, your donations pay for our hosting, our bandwidth, contractors that we need to hire, fun things that we try to do every once in a while. And we do appreciate any amount that you're able to give from $5 to $5,000. The larger numbers are fantastic, but the smaller numbers add up over time. You make this show possible. We accept donations through PayPal and have made the process really easy by putting donation buttons at the bottom of the pages uh, for each show page. So you go to twist.org, go to the go to the website, uh, listen to the most recent episode, maybe make a comment or something in the comment section and hit one of those donation buttons. We thank you for your support. We really, really couldn't do it without you.
And we're back with more this week in science. That's right. All right, Justin, tell me a story. I've got so many stories. This is a... Uh... This is one that's been reported on previously, but it is. Oh, wait. We're going to go ahead. Ah, Who's that? Ah, Who's that? It's my You're phone ringing. Oh. Uh, this, is, this is something that we, we reported on previously, but it needs to catch on. This is something that we need to be doing and soon. Basically, uh, getting people to chill out after a heart attack is one of the most important things that we can do to reduce the after effects of having a stroke and needs it's something that's been tested pretty pretty decently at this point and and needs to in the relatively short period of time get instituted in the hospitals they need to be able to take somebody who's just had a heart attack been rushed to the hospital and put them in a therapeutic hypothermia state uh, and this is so here's here's the story here forced body cooling known as therapeutic hypothermia, has reduced in-hospital deaths amongst sudden, sudden cardiac arrest patients nearly 12% between 2001 and 2009, according to a study by the Mayo Clinic. They're presenting this at the upcoming American Academy of Neurology 2012 annual meeting in New Orleans. So this is, uh, there's a, I've got basically a bunch of abstracts from that here. Uh, the goal of therapeutic cooling is slowing down a body's metabolism and preventing brain damage or death. It is believed that mild th therapeutic hypothermia suppresses harmful chemical reactions in the brain, thereby preserving the cells. Two key studies published in 2002 found therapeutic hypothermia more effective for sudden cardiac arrest patients than any of the traditional therapies that are currently in place. More so, uh, this is also, uh, there's another end of this too, which is that not only is the pres pres preservation of a life something that's very important, that 12% uh, better success rate is, some is something that if you're having a heart attack, you're going to want that 12%. You want every percent that you can get of surviving. But it also had a massive impact on preventing the neurological disorder that comes after having a stroke. Those uh, in the in this study, they found that the the differences also they, they kind of broke it down as a cost thing. Researchers studied thirty five hundred over thirty five hundred patients aged seventy to eighty nine, categorized into four groups: normal, mild cognitive impairment, newly discovered dementia, and prevalent dementia. Mean medical care costs rose from six thousand for people in the normal group to eleven thousand per year over 11,000 per year for those with prevalent dementia. So if right. you can, I mean, just the, the cost savings to our uh, to individuals requiring health care or to insurance companies or whoever's picking up the bill, tremendous. Enough to pay for a facility in every hospital to have one of these, uh, one of these, the, these hypothermia uh, stations in their hospitals. It's, well, it's just interesting. such an interesting... Mm -hmm. I know with, with with open heart surgery, they cool the blood. That's one of the, the new techniques is cooling the blood. And um, let's see if I can get my camera. Cooling the blood and uh, and pumping it through a, an external pump so that it, it it in effect leads to hypothermia of the of the brain during open heart surgery and that there's some slight memory loss as you recover from that but in the end it's better and so you have have less uh less problem overall um but this is interesting that they're kind of applying this idea to patients who actually have had damage to the heart or had damage to the head the brain through stroke yeah I was talking with a uh, an anesthesiologist today who talked about some research he's been doing where it, uh, they've found this brain pattern called burst suppression that um, seems to be involved in protecting the brain and it might also be involved in uh, pr protecting a, a lot of cellular activity. So uh, it's this very basic pattern where the the uh, activity in the brain slows down and then it goes through these short bursts where it goes crazy and then it gets tamped down for a period of time so it's quiet and then it go gets active and it gets quiet again and this burst suppression they think actually helps to um, 
reduce metabolism so that less oxygen is used, less less harmful uh, metabolic byproducts are produced. And so it, at the same time, it can, the brain consumes less blood, uh, needs less circulation. Um, you know, so there, that could be, there could be something definitely lining up in these, in these various, uh, uh, parameters. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, the, the, I'd love to hear more about, it. is that like a part of the GABA system in the brain that's doing I this burst suppression? I have no idea. He said that, um, that the burst suppression happens, uh, when you, when someone's under deep anesthesia. So if they're deep, deep in anesthesia, this burst suppression happens. Um, it occurs with uh, trauma that the brain, if, if you're unconscious due to trauma that the brain goes into this burst suppression uh, pattern. And then additionally, premature babies exhibit the burst suppression. And then as they get older, um, up to the point where they should actually um, start having uh, brain function, uh, that uh, then the burst suppression goes away. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. It's very, it's very interesting. So I think it like you're you in this, the hypothermia is going to reduce metabolism. It's going to, there's going to be less blood, less, uh, less blood used, um, less oxygen consumed. The cell metabolism is going to slow down and it probably very similar. So you reduce energy energy uh, need in the body and in the brain. So the heart muscle doesn't need as much energy because everything's cooled down and slowed down. Um, nothing has to work as hard. And so because it's not working as hard, it is protect, uh, protective. Totally. I would, I would love yeah. to have one of these researchers working on this, on the show uh, and, and to see, uh, to, to, to apply them with some of these questions. Yeah. That would be uh, that would be a neat Neat yeah. future show, because I think that I think there's gonna I think this is gonna have to happen. I mean, this is one of those things. If it's the most effective treatment, <laughs> if it's out if it's outdoing every other treatment out there currently, or when somebody comes in off the stretcher into the hospital, it needs to be implemented. Yeah. So, all right. Do you want to continue with the brain theme? Should I? I have a brain scan story, or should Give I go me into? More brain. Or should I talk about printing your own drugs? Ooh. ooh. <laughs> well, that's sort of a brain story too. I mean, it's just it's choosing that's between kind of... two brain stories now. I know. Uh, so some researchers at Dartmouth University have published in the Journal of Neuroscience an fMRI study, functional magnetic resonance imaging study, um, uh, looking at how the brain responds to, uh, to cues, image cues, and uh, enabled the prediction of future behavior. So um, in this study, they imaged the brain as, uh, as individuals were... Um, shown pictures of cheesecake or, um, you know, something that's a really yummy, yummy food. Um, and then other, other pictures they, they were given, they were shown, um, were very sexy images. And the researchers say just as Q reactivity to food images was investigated as potential predictors of weight gain, Q reactivity to sexual images was used to predict sexual desire. And that the participants who responded, their brains responded to the food images, uh, they were more likely to go on to gain weight later, that they were more likely to respond to food in their daily life. Um, but if they did not respond to the sexual images, then that didn't, so sexual images did not predict weight gain. Food images did not predict sex activity. And they were very specific, and they're calling this material specificity. So um, the interesting aspect is that they're able to actually use these brain scans to predict what people are going to do in the future. So individuals who were more likely to, who, who responded, their brains responded to the sexual images, were more likely to go on and have more sex or look at porn sites when they... Um, mm -hmm in the future. Um, so what they're, what they're interested in is how people respond to tempting situations. 
if you're in a situation, you're walking by a uh, a bakery or you're walking by a place that offers lap dances, let's say, how are you going to respond to that temptation? Um, I hear somebody listening to this. No? That was interesting. No, I, heard it. I heard it. But anyway, um, so the... Uh, they, how they respond, how they respond to that. And then how can you work around the way that the brain responds to images or to things in the environment to be able to uh, predict what people are going to do so that people can predict their own behavior and actually enable people to work better and have higher willpower. Um, currently, people's future behavior can also be predicted by their, uh, by their heart rate. So if um, if this studies like this have been done with just heart rate monitoring, which probably is a little bit easier to do than just than than sticking somebody in an fMRI machine, but it's um, it's it's interesting that something like this you can see how the brain responds specifically to imagery and know predict that somebody is going to gain weight or want to have sex. That, that is the ultimate uh, uh, sort of pre-dating, <laughs> online dating screener. <laughs> like, <laughs> 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 yeah, before we go on this date, before we go any further, before we can go date one, we just go into, uh, into the lab and take this test. Just want to see how you're wired. Yeah, or somebody, you know, wants to be, wants to work for the CIA. Or the no, FBI, no. The, you know, the Secret Service. The Secret That's Service, would, right? That would be really handy. How the do you respond service. to, you know, what kind of, you know, how do you respond <laughs> to certain images? How does their brain respond? I mean, that's, I mean, could stuff like this, understanding uh, how you physiologically and how you neurally respond to stimuli in your environment and what that can predict about your future behavior how will that affect uh, the future of possibly getting a job? <laughs> right, totally. It's interesting. Not that, and, not and that will we there always be, act on those urges, but... And, and will there be some sort of government assistance for those of us who, like, say me, <laughs> have a red flag in every potential career choice? <laughs> exactly. Ah. He's, like, he's just, he's absolutely... Fad. The new diet fad. Yeah, you would get your brain. You would look at the brain images from week to week, and maybe this week you're more stimulated by food, so you're going to have to protect yourselves from the, yourself from that food. And maybe the next week you're not, so you can you can you can manage yourself. Yes, exactly. Ooh, or even better, <laughs> you could have mm -hmm. the uh, a a television station that's the Diet Network, the you know Skinny <laughs> TV. Which the only thing that it's not all about food or diets or anything like that. That's never even mentioned. They never mention food. There's none of the television sh uh, episodes ever have any food product placements. None of the commercials are allowed to have any food product placements. And if you watch this channel and this channel alone, you'll be guaranteed to lose weight because you won't have be have any of those visual food triggers. <laughs> That's right. You're not watching any food triggers whatsoever. You will lose weight. That's a whole <laughs> new scale of media marketing right there. This, this media what channel... You, what do you not content. show people? Yeah. <laughs> Our content could be, as, could be as terrible as the next network. We're not saying we're any better there. However, you'll lose weight just by watching. Yeah. Wow. Or you will have many, many children and be viral or viral. <laughs> could be viral or viral. Could be both viral <laughs> and viral if you watch their other network. Oh dear, oh dear. All right, tell me a story. I'll get to the the drug printing in a minute. Uh, my mouse just uh, wait. No, oh, maybe it's gonna work. Is it uh, okay? Uh, here we go. People who are modest and consume alcohol have healthier livers, proving once and for all that two vices can make a right. So this is people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease who consume alcohol in modest amounts. Nope, more than two servings a day. So this isn't modest people. This is people who consume modest amounts of alcohol. Uh, right. One or two servings a day. So that's, I'd, I'd call that bashful. 
um, alcohol use, not even modest, are half as likely, this is really the amazing thing, half as likely to develop hepatitis as non-drinkers with the same condition. Uh, reports a national team of scientists led by researchers at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine. Findings are published in the April 19th, 2012 online issue, Journal of Hepatology, which is always a fun read. The uh, NALFD, or the uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, is the most common liver disease in the United States. It affects up to one-third of American adults. It's amazing. I've never heard of this, and it affects one-third of adults. It is characterized by abnormal fat accumulation in the liver. Specific cause or causes are not uh, clearly understood, though obesity and diabetes are risk factors. Most patients with this have few or no symptoms, but it, in its most progressive form, known as non-alcoholic stadiohepatitis or NASH, there is significantly heightened risk of psoriasis, liver cancer, and liver-related death. It is also, NALFD is also a known risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So it's kind of interesting. We've had... Mm. We've understood for a while that there's these reports that moderate alcohol use can reduce your chance of having a heart attack. Uh, can, you know, but maybe this is what it is. Maybe it's not affecting, of course, the heart, or it's not just that you're more relaxed or, or anything like that. Could be that uh, if it could be affecting the liver in such a way that the liver isn't becoming the catalyst for the heart attack. Interesting. That's a speculation, but it's very... Um, uh, uh, correlative. Patients with NALFD are approximately two times more likely to die from coronary heart disease than from liver disease. Studies authors wanted to know if the well-documented heart-healthy benefits of modest alcohol consumption outweighed alcohol's negative effects, and the answer came back resoundingly, yes. That, That's good. That, yeah, that's pretty. That's uh, another 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 win for alcohol. Another win for alcohol. <laughs> you're, you're you're like, I'm gonna keep keep tabs keep tabs here. Yeah, well, that's, it's it's kind of interesting because you think of you sort of think of the alcohol as having just a purely negative effect on the liver, right? Right, and and in this yeah. case, it's almost as though it's. I don't know if it's uh, doesn't go into detail here, but maybe it's somehow exercising <laughs> the liver a little bit more, making it function uh, at a higher rate. To more efficiently. Oxygen. Maybe it's working more efficiently. Whatever reason, it's uh, it's it's helping uh, at least a third of American adults who are af affected with this. Have you ever heard of this before? Because this is the first yeah. time I've heard of the disease, this fatty liver disease. And, and, you know, a third of Americans, that seems really high. And patients yeah. with, the, well, uh, with this are, are usually, it's the 12, cirrhosis. So the patients who have this, which is a third of us, right, 10 times more likely to progress to cirrhosis, the final phase of cr uh, chronic liver disease. Cirrhosis is the 12th leading cause of death in the United States, killing an estimated 27,000 Americans annually. That's 27,000 Americans uh, who could have been saved by drinking. <laughs> I don't know that they necessarily could have been saved by it, but uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll see, we'll here's see the where this knowledge this is incredible goes. Numbers. The yeah. study showed that uh, the, those with the modest alcohol intake, a couple of drinks a day, half the odds... Half the odds of developing NASH. Now, you figure if you have a, you know, you have a third of a chance, right? I guess a third of but a I chance. But I think you'd be more likely by drinking a lot of alcohol, you'd be more likely of succumbing to the fatty liver disease. And so some individual, uh, uh, that's hepatitis not a, individuals. That's not data that doesn't exist, Kirsten. You don't know. That's not here. It's nowhere here. It doesn't say anything about that here. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. We're coming to the end of the show. I want to jump into the uh, DIY 
DIY. I love the idea of people being able to do stuff at home. And Lee Cronin, who is uh, the gardener chair of chemistry at uh, University of Glasgow, he and his team have published a paper in the journal Nature Chemistry outlining a process to create reaction wear using off the using a uh, an open source commercially available 3D printer that uh, that is operated by open source software and uh, there this reaction wear the 3D printer would print reaction vessels for chemical uh, interactions to take place and in the ve- the building of the vessels the vessel itself becomes part of the chemical reaction says dr cronin so what you in in what they're in effect printing are these uh, this this could be in the lab it could be in your garage at home it could be anybody printing chemical reaction materials and if you think far enough it could lead to uh the ability for people to print their own drugs at home so you don't have to go to the pharmacy because you've got a 3d printer and you have an app from the pharmacist that will allow you to produce the chemical that you need through the printing of this reaction vessel and putting particular chemicals in it and maybe there is a device that occur- that controls the entire chemical process start to finish to allow uh, you to print your own drugs. I mean, it's just a far-fetched idea, but it's this, the, they've come up with this first step. So for chemists, uh, it's a really new way of thinking that instead of having an inert vessel for the chemical reactions that they're doing to take place, the vessel itself is actually an integral part of what is being built and created. All through 3D printing technology. 3D printing technology at home, it's warping the future. Just this is this is disruptive technology. I love it. I love yeah, it's it. It's the it's the uh, food replicator. Right. It's actually arrived. I mean if we can start <laughs> If we can start pumping out you food can, and you drugs can print out of these your things. Own pink slime. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You can print your own pink slime. What what? So, um, what do you think makes a movie line the most memorable, Justin? Uh, let's see. If you kill somebody right after you say it. Okay. I'll That's be one- back. Right. Make my day. Right. You know, that's it's all those taglines from the horrible action movies of the 80s <laughs> that really. It's my boomstick. Right. Say hello to my little friend. You know, it's exactly. all of that stuff. So and that and- one, put that movie, that line is in every movie now. Like every kid's yeah. movie. It's been out for like last two years has that in there. Well, some researchers decided that they wanted to know what makes a a movie line memorable, the things that people quote all the time. What is it that allows a certain line for everyone to remember it? Like everyone, because, you know, everybody knows, say hello to my little friend. People, like you said, it's in all all other movies now. So uh, they developed an algorithm to search uh, and search the IMDb database for uh, catchy quotes and they paired catchy quotes with uh, not so catchy lines that were spoken by the same characters in the same movie um, at around the same time. So they uh, they came up with an algorithm to to actually investigate what was the what were the components making the memorableness occur. And so uh, they say that what sets them apart from common language are a number of of things. So they occur during, um, they have, uh, they have, they occur during compelling circumstances or fit in a existing cultural, political, or social narrative, according to the authors. Now, um, additionally, Quotes generality. 
a, a quote has to be able to apply to other things. So say hello to my little friend. It's not necessarily something that can only be used in one situation. People can, you know, take it and use it in their own daily lives if the situa if a situation seems right for it. Um, so the they found the fewer personal pronouns, the better. Second person pronouns are excluded. Personal pronouns imbue a quote with specificity by referencing a specific person. Um, utterances containing indefinite indefinite articles like a and an are more memorable than those containing the, and they avoid the past tense. So they're in a present tense. They're referring to something in the now. Uh, so they, they have this computer model. It can analyze sentences and um, predict or, or distinguish between memorable and non-memorable. And their computer program uh, can pick the memorable ones 64% of the time. And this compares to people picking the memorable quotes 78% of the time. So their computer program is actually pretty good. And so um, maybe computer programs are going to help write movies in the future. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> I guess, I mean, I can see that. We have <laughs> the benditos are... You know, we, we didn't used to need the badges. <laughs> the <laughs> <We're> badges. <laughs> badges. We don't need no stinking badges. We you didn't. Know, we, we never used to need the badges. <laughs> I, I guess we should get some because I guess it could come handy. Like it wouldn't be, it doesn't have quite the same. No, it doesn't have the same, the same ring. So anyway, yay science, making the unexplicable things in life more explicable. <laughs> <laughs> more explicable. I love that. I'm going to use that from now on. Awesome. Thank you for making that way more explicable for me. You're welcome. I like to make <laughs> things explicable. <laughs> All right, everybody, that is the end of our show. This weekend, we're doing a live show at the Skeptical Conference in Berkeley, 1130 a.m. to 1230 p.m. That's right. And the next week is uh, next week's fundraiser week at KDBS. So get ready to support Freeform non-commercial. Wow, so this is going to be three radio. shows in one week. Boom! It's kind of crazy. Kate, we, we, to, got, we, we got this one going on right here right now. We got uh, Saturday, the one at Skeptical in Berkeley. And then there's going to be a third time when we're going to have to say stuff on, a, which is going to be Tuesday morning. Ah! It's kind of craziness, kind of, but we can do this. We can do this, Justin. There's enough science in the world. Yeah. Let's end this thing. <laughs> All right, Kirsten. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as, as a podcast. In fact, that is where most people listen to the show. Uh, just search for This Week in Science in the iTunes directory, or if you have an Android device, you can Google Twist 4 Droid. That's Twist, the number four droid in the app marketplace. Also available on in the uh, iPhones marketplace as well. We're everywhere. That's right. And for more information on anything that you've heard here today, show notes are going to be available on our website, twist.org. We also want to hear from you. So email us at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com or justin at thisweekinscience.com. And be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in that subject line of the email. Otherwise, it will be spam filtered into oblivion. Uh, although, you could also contact us on Twitter at Dr. Kiki or at Jacksonfly. Or the show's uh, nexus of, of, of information, at Twist Science on the Twitter. We love your That's feedback. Right. If there is a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, please let us know. And we will be back here next week and hope that you will join us once again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 
This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy Jeopardy, jeopardy And this week in science is coming your way so everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi, aye, 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 aye. Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. Laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got But how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything This week in science, this week in science, 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 this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. this week in science, 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 this week in science.